Okay. Hello, Carrie. Hello, Dr. Agarwal. How are you? Good. I've been waiting for this for long, uh, two weeks. You know, a lot, lot of things happen in two weeks. So I was thinking about, you know, we will talk a lot of different things. And we, sure. will, we will talk about things we have learned during our celebrations when we're giving money. So, and uh, please, everybody, chip in, talk to us. I've also invited Arthur. Um, Arthur is here. He made you, uh, Arthur Henson. He gonna he gonna tell us you know what what we need to do to bring invite him to come to Georgia. So, um, Carrie, go ahead and start the program. Okay, great. Well, tonight we were just gonna go over um, the bazooka that I think everybody has a copy of the 2020 bazooka. Um, it's something that the ACO Palm Beach ACO uh, created and distributes. Um, to all the providers. And we just kind of wanted to go through it um, so that everybody knows how to use it. Um, a couple disclaimers. I just want everybody to know that, you know, anytime a document is written and put out there, it's already outdated. So, you know, there are some um, additions that can, you know, be made to this and it will at the next version whenever that happens. Um, but for right now, this is the version that we're using. Um, it, it's a not an all-inclusive document, but rather it highlights some of the most common conditions um, that you see in, in the primary offices. So I just want to go through it very quickly. Um, you'll see that there's two columns. It kind of lists over on the left column, you'll see diabetes. It gives you the description of the condition. It gives you the code. It gives you the risk score, and it also tells you what risk category it falls into. So just for example, you can see diabetes with no complications um, has a score of 0 0.105 and it hits um, the HCC bucket of 19. If you go down, once you get into hyperglycemia and the complications, you'll see that the score increases and it goes into bucket 18. So really what I want you to understand is that, that you don't get, if you code one day diabetes and then another visit you code diabetes with complications, you don't bump off the scores. You get the higher score of the two. So you would lose the score for the diabetes without complications, but you would get the score for with complications, which is a higher value. Um, and it kind of goes through some of the complications, um, diabetes with kidney disease, nephropathy. It's giving you the codes that should be used. I want to make one note here. Um, the new um, ICD-10s came out October 1. There was a change to uh, chronic kidney disease stage three. They actually added two more codes um, and they broke it up to stage 3A and stage 3B. So you now have to code accordingly. So um, I would suspect further down the line when they revise the HCC buckets that probably on CKD stage three unspecified and stage three A will probably fall off the risk score list and you probably will only going forward be getting credit for stage three B, but that hasn't happened yet, but um, eventually it probably will in the next version. So please start coding it according to stage A and B. Um, everything else pretty much stays the same. You could see the categories that they fall into. Um, with the kidney diseases, you got your dependence on renal dialysis. Don't forget um, to code that as well because you'll get the additional score of 0 0.435, which you're going to need to cover the dialysis. Um, it also goes on to um, the neuro complications, the same things that we've always talked about. Um, please note here that in this complication, you see this G63. It probably in the next version, we'll be moving that because G63 is um, neuropathy and diseases classified elsewhere. And if you look in your coding guidelines and your coding books, there is a very um, bold excludes one note, which says, regardless of the origin of the neuropathy, if your patient is a diabetic, you can never use this code. 
So we're probably going to reclassify that on the next version because that is not applicable to a diabetic. Um, but all the other conditions you see are um, vascular disease, same thing. Um, note again here, you know, you get the double scores for the PAD. But it really just goes on if you're if you're in the office and, and you're in the suite with the patient and you're looking for a code, I tell my docs, keep this in your exam room. When you're doing a progress note, if you need to reference, oh, what is that? What is that code? You can actually go to the category for the diabetic with the complications and more than likely you'll find the code right here rather quickly. Um, so it goes down the list. Yeah. Can I represent other people? Uh, who listening to this talk? What I like yeah. to know is how do you use this bazooka in the practice? Is this bazooka in each room, or every yeah. family is holding this up, or it is by the coder only, or or doctor yeah. me had to have in my pocket? Uh, yeah, we here um, for my docs. They keep it in the exam room, and it's kind of right next to their their laptop or their keyboard. So as they're typing in the description, they always they're like, oh, diabetes. Let me make sure that I'm I'm getting the right code that that carries a score, you know. Um, so they use it to verify when they're completing their assessments that they're using the correct code that will ultimately get them a score. Because you know, many times there's codes. One variation could mean a score versus no score. So this is just kind of like a cheat sheet guide that they would just quick reference and say, oh, um, cardiac disorders, you can see on the right hand side, oh, oh, they have angina, oh, but wait, they have, you know, CAD with angina, let me, that's the code I need to use. Um, you know, so this will give them the most common codes that will, um, so, ultimately equate to a score. If I'm in the clinic, like Dr. Haver in the clinic, he should have this, and he see a diabetic patient, he goes step by step, also check his teeth, his gum, see if he's got a, yeah. he's got a problem with the gum, and maybe then he code that, that. He just document that and code that, right? Correct. So for, for coronary artery disease, I just go step by step and, and see what is not uh, what is in the chart and, and and try to find the highest level of the code is that right correct correct so if you've got somebody with chf here it will give you um you know the correct codes to use for that um but each category will give you the most common codes um you know with the score and then it will also give you a couple that you can see without the scores so um you know it kind of guides them, you know, CAD without angina has no value, but if the patient has stable angina with CAD, it has a value, you know, so mm -hmm. it, it prompts the doctor to think, oh, well, you know, he does have angina, but, you know, he really has been pretty stable for, you know, quite some time, but he still, you know, has the RX out there. I should still code for the CAD mm -hmm. with the angina. So it, it just kind of is a reference guide to just validate um, that they're selecting the appropriate code and also triggers them to think about other ways to code certain conditions. So, Gary, let me tell you that this is the first day, first time I've seen bazooka so detailed. And I suddenly realized, you know, I need to have this bazooka in my office. Each room should have that, each yes. image should have it, and I should have it in my pocket. So, every time I'm thinking about coronary artery disease, I need to say, how need to describe it, how to put the data in there, how to put the uh, documentation in the chart. Because most of the thing, if I ask, start asking, looking for it, I'm gonna find the right code for the right diagnosis, and which will be a significant higher MRA than what I'm doing. Exactly, it also helps because, you know, um, if you were to search in your EMR system based on a typed out description, uh, of a condition, you would get 10 different variations of the description, you, you know, and so you wanna make sure you're comparing the, the condition that you're selecting in your EMR it is the same condition that's on here and it, it equates to the diagnosis code that will get you the score. 
you know, and that's where a lot of confusion comes in. Some the doctor will type, you know, um, angina or whatever, or or CAD, and they're just, you know, they see the first few trigger words and they're clicking on it, not really realizing that that wasn't the most appropriate code. And if they referenced the bazooka, they would see that oh, CAD with stable angina is really what I should be using. So it's it's kind of just a, a great tool to to have as the doctors are you know searching for their their diagnosis and their descriptions in in their assessment area just to validate that they are using the appropriate code for that condition that carries the MRA score. So um, and it goes through each category. There's some in here. Um, that have little caveat um, um, information, like you'll see down here on the left, the tertiary link, long-term supplemental oxygen dependence. And then the little note says, also see chronic respiratory failure, because if they're on, um, if they are oxygen dependent, I would expect to see a diagnosis of chronic respiratory failure also coded. Um, so it gives you little cheat sheets um, you know, to help trigger if there could be a secondary condition that maybe you're overlooking. But it definitely is a great tool to have right there in the exam room. Um, Dr. Agarwal, I'm not sure if we could get the print any smaller to make it pocket size. Don't, this is good. I'm going to put it on my computer all the time. I want to make sure yeah, that everybody yeah. knows about it. Matter of yeah. fact, I'm going to learn myself. And then make sure that you know I this is awesome. Very, yeah, very, very interesting. A lot of doctors actually pin it up on the wall in like their lunch rooms and that. So when they're having lunch and have nothing else to do, they kind of breeze through it and read through it. And just it helps to keep them familiar with what your risk adjustment co um, conditions are and the appropriate codes to use. Um, you know, it gives you in, in your depressions, it gives you your stages for mild, moderate, severe. Um, it, it's got a lot of information on here. Um, and like I said to you, there are some times that will point you to also think about a secondary condition that might go along with that. Um, it gives you, you know, some of the uh, amputation statuses that a lot of providers always forget to document. Um, and believe it or not, they have to document them each time, otherwise you lose the score. Um, it's just a thing that CMS has. Um, but definitely use this as a tool. Like I said, it's not an all-inclusive list, but it will, it will guide you um, to think about, um, you know, is there a more specific code that I could use that carries a score? Um, like I, I'll give you an example. A lot of providers um, will just document um, colitis, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, colitis typically, it, you know, it used to only be ulcerative colitis that hit the scores, but actually now, the past two years, if you documented colitis as left-sided colitis, which most of it is, that also would get you the score. It doesn't now have to be ulcerative. So, you know, it gives you um, quite a bit of um, options to choose from. Um, and it also makes you think about, um, you know, so a lot of your status codes, your your um, transplants. Uh, you know, it, it just keeps you in check, again, that you're using the most appropriate code for your risk adjustment um, population. So, Kelly, okay, that, that's great. Do you have anything else to talk about? Because yeah, I just I, new I, oh, I handed out a couple of other handouts really um, quick that I just wanted to go over the new um, 2021 updates. I gave Daryl uh, the handout so that everybody could actually have the entire list. Um, but you could see here uh, there was like over 500 changes to the ICD-10. Um, not many of them had impact to MRA, but I would suspect in the coming year or two that the 21 codes um, described withdrawal from substance um, will 
will be newly added probably within the next two years to the MRA listing. So um, all your your abuse and use codes that, that are associated with withdrawal, well, you'll probably start to see them coming through on the horizons. Um, I also added this really quick. This is the um, what they call the pump chart and no political pun intended. Um, but this is just a guide to, to show you that um, you know there are times when you may um, have multiple uh, maybe cancers. You're coding two different types of cancers. So if you code lung, then you have to drop your other cancers that fall into another category. Um, so you will only get one score. Um, like for example, if you had breast cancer, um, which actually I believe goes to um, code, uh, category 11 maybe, um, and then it you had metastatic or secondary cancer to the lung, you would, if you only coded that as lung cancer, you would only get the, the score for the category nine, which is a little higher. But if you correctly documented it as secondary cancer to the lung, you would get um, almost double the score. And so it's all dependent on how you document things. But there, I just wanted you to know that there are times, like for the diabetes, if you code diabetes without complications and then you code it with complications, you're going to lose the simple category of 19, but you're going to get the higher score of 18. So these are all the categories that you would have dropped conditions in because you're getting the more complicated or higher score. Um, so that's that table, just in case anybody wanted to know. Um, and then here's your disease interactions, um, which gives you additional scores. If your patient is diabetic and CHF, you actually get an additional score on top of the two scores for those categories. So these are important to know as well. And then lastly, this is something relatively new and I'm not sure that everybody knows about it, but once your patient has four or more different HCC categories or buckets, conditions, you also get an additional score. So if you have four, if your patient has four HCC categories, say diabetes, AFib, uh, maybe angina and, you know, maybe CHF, you're going to get all those scores, plus you're going to get an additional score because you've hit four HCCs. And you can see as you go down the list, the score increases. So it's important to know um, that all of those things add into your scores. And then, of course, here's your takeaways. Um, all value-based payment methodologies really rely on the HCCs, uh, make sure you're doing comprehensive annual coding, um, make sure you're following all your guidelines. And this one, think in ink, treatment is evidence of disease. Make sure you're writing down your treatment plans and stay informed on top of all the changes and make sure you're doing internal audits and chart reviews every year. And you should be in good shape. Thank you, thank you, Kerry. So thank you. I, I'm I'm telling you, we want to continue this uh, session of learning MRA, bringing MRA to our practice. I want to tell you what I learned on Saturday. You know, we were celebrating our success, and in doing success, a lot of things came in my mind. That one of the questions people ask, you know, why didn't I make money, and uh, and what was PMPM is, what is the benchmark is. So we're going to cover all that a little bit today. But before we go there, I just I also discuss the future. So what we all as a group in doctors SEO or any other SEO, what can we do um, to prepare ourselves to welcome Dr. Hansen group to help us to create what they have done in Palm Beach. So Dr. Hansen, tell us about what we need to do to make you feel like you know you have to come to us. Now we are ready for you. Hi, thank you, Dr. Agarwal. Always a pleasure to be on your, uh, be part of your, your, your program. It looks to me that uh, Carrie and you guys are already halfway to uh, get to where we're doing uh, in terms of creating a Medicare Advantage plan because you guys are doing, um, learning the, probably the most important 
aspect of a successful Medicare Advantage plan, which is, uh, I don't want them to say that, like where the money is, but actually where the money is. And, and the reason why it's so important is traditionally in fee for service, uh, the doctors and the coders and the uh, billing companies have always taken the least path of resistance and they get paid if there's one code, um, one code in the diagnosis as opposed uh, the same as if there's five codes for the diagnosis. So when that patient ends up switching to a Medicare Advantage plan, the Medicare Advantage, the government pays the Medicare plan, Advantage plan one lump sum on the patient's illness, and the only way they know the illness is based on that diagnosis. So it happens so often that a, a, a pedic Medicare patient fee for service has been transferred over, and the majority of the primary care codes are just one, and we can just say hypertension. So they have a fee that how much does it take to take care of that patient for with the hypertension? But since nobody has done really proper coding or accurate coding or hasn't included a lot of the specialist situations, we miss that the patient's also, you know, potentially diabetic, may also have some sort of arthritis, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, may have some level of, you know, cystic, cyst issues, polyps, whatever the case is. So the government doesn't include that, but once it gives it to you, at that hype, only that one diagnosis hypertension, they still expect you to take care of every condition that patient has, A to Z, they kind of don't care. Thus, your Medicare Advantage plan is potentially at a deficit right off the bat. So it's not about collecting all the money that for the wrong reasons, about collecting all the money so you can provide the highest level of service for your patients which are sick and uh, being able to meet the goals of those patients. But if it's not documented, the government doesn't see it. And it's just like anything, if it's not charted, it's not there. But they're not reading the notes, they're only looking at the claims data from their perspective and only the primary care claims data to be more specific. So it's the, the job of the primary care to get all the others if we're obviously etching to that space. So um, we're, we're here to talk today about what the future is for doctors ACO and is there a viable option to consider uh, creating or replicating a physician uh, owned uh, entity for a Medicare Advantage plan and there are a lot of benefits to doing it uh, physician owned. Um, it, to me it seems like it's a, a little bit of a loophole because um, it's something in the healthcare world that we as physicians are allowed to own, allowed to support, allowed to refer to, and, um, um, and, and obviously uh, improve upon and have full investor rights to it. Um, it's, it's a very, very uh, hard barrier to get into the insurance business um, it's a high barrier, so that's probably why they never thought physicians would be able to actively get into it. But now with the ACO model, uh, I believe uh, the ACO model is the, the holy grail for physicians to get into uh, the insurance arena because it already has established a set of organized physicians and a pathway to get those physicians uh, the tools they need to succeed in a physician-owned uh, Medicare Advantage plan. Um, and we have been working at it at Palm Beach for a while. Uh, we've made, uh, we've hit a lot of speed bumps, um, but I'm very confident the next time we go to another county, and if we decide to go to Clark County or uh, in other counties up in Georgia, uh, we won't be having the, the, the high speed bumps that we've hit here. Uh, so the, the second one we do is easier than the third and the third and such and such and such. Uh, but the, the motivation and the assets that you, the asset wealth that you will have by creating your own insurance plan uh, is potentially uh, unmeasurable. Um, you guys are probably in, in, in a world now where a lot of MSOs are coming 
and they're forming all these entities and they're creating uh, potential nice revenue returns. Uh, our model is no MSO. Uh, we are basically going to be nimble enough to do all the support that any MSO can do. Thus, we are creating the, the asset that you guys are potentially giving to other MSOs. So if you have an MSO uh, in your area and you're successful with them, great, we love it. But when that MSO goes and sells or transfers hands to somewhere else, the physician is really not getting any asset gaining benefit from there. Um, and, the, and the space right now, uh, Medicare Advantage space is, appears to be very hot and is valued extremely high. There, there's one now that's going public called Clover Health, and you guys can Google it. Uh, the values are crazy. It has, it's going to be an IPO coming to the stock market. Um, the value is very, very high. Uh, another one is Devoted, very, very high. Uh, that one's not public, it's privately held, but it, it keeps going to the equity world to get create more money. Um, now, again, those entities, doctors are not part of it, so they're not benefiting, yet they're creating the building blocks to get them to those high valuations. So we want to create something that we can create and we can benefit from, and that's a real asset. As much as you guys have done amazing work, uh, you know, all of you, the team up here created an amazing uh, ACO. It's hard to say how much of the of a value you've created because you know we're all ACOs are based on contracts with the government, and we just don't know how long the contracts are going to continue. Uh, perpetually in the future for. So an investor is um, a little bit cynical about coming into throwing a lot of money at a potential asset that's based on a government contract. Uh, we, have, we have the same scenario in Palm Beach ACO. We're very, very successful. I just, I just it, it's not like a proven business model of an HMO that's been in existence for 55 years and it's a true asset. Um, uh, in, in that sense. Um, so, uh, but uh, the ACO is the first step to organize doctors. What you guys are doing with the MRA is another awesome step. Um, if we want to consider seriously coming into your marketplace, um, it, it, the best way to do it is where the doctors have skin in the game um, and we can, we can maybe survey the doctors to see how much of an interest they would want to do. Um, we can come up with a pledge form to see how interested they are in terms of raising money. Uh, you do not want to do this unless doctors are vested in it. Um, and then once they commit and we have the majority of your ACO doctors committed to considering this, uh, we can do a deep analysis of your market uh, and determine if we can just do it in Clark County or we need to do it in a couple of the surrounding counties as well. Um, and we could uh, do actuaries and projections and uh, determine the feasibility of doing such a project uh, in your marketplace. But my feeling personally, it depends on the enthusiasm of the doctors. If you tell me you guys have 60 doctors and only 10 of them want to do that, that's not enough. If you tell me that you know 50 out of your 60 doctors are willing to put some money up to do this, that would uh, that would make it uh, much better, much better. And there's a lot of advantages for the physician to be an owner in this. Um, it, the the biggest advantage besides the the financial benefits if it's successful, uh, it's the fact that you're going to be a part of a plan that if you're an owner cannot kick you off the plan. So if you join a, one of the other plans, you know, uh, they can kick you off in five minutes for whatever reason and move the patients to, to a, a clinic. Usually the legacy plans, you know, they advertise, they get a lot of extra patients and they usually give it to their, at least in this marketplace, they give it to their own clinics that they own or in those regards. But here, when we advertise it may be a source of new patients to the doctors, um, it may be, uh, it'll be a source for the physicians to have true, um, true um, 
uh, a, have a true ability in changing the patient's care in the HMO itself. As an investor, uh, their voice will be heard. Uh, as an investor, there's a much higher level of trust that the physician wants to do what's best, not only for the patient, but also for the plan. Uh, so there, there's a lot of positives that I see that ultimately will benefit the patient's health and well-being. There's not going to be a large administrative cost uh, that, that is going to subsequently take funds away from the patient's quality or the physician's uh, reimbursement. There's not going to be a tremendous amount of advertising uh, that costs X amount of millions of dollars for branding and things like that, that is also going to take away funds for the patient care uh, and also the physician's reimbursement. There's not going to be an MSO that's taking a, a significant chunk or a middleman taking a significant chunk of the funny again, money again that, uh, that funds go to the, the patient product and the physicians. So we can create something where we cut out all the middlemen, cut out the administration, cut out a lot of these high price brokers, cut out the, the advertising, and use the funds where they should go for the patient care and fair and profitable, a fair reimbursement for our physicians. Um, and at the same time, be able to build something that has an equity value that is an asset for all of us. Dr. Hansen. On Saturday, we gave, you know, we gave a big check for all investors. They will give all the checks. And uh, basically, it was an incredible return on investment, almost 76% for two years. So all those doctors are asking us, you know, where can we put the money? So, you know, I would say, if we say that we are ready, so what will be the timeline? What we need to, well, we like to say that you start evaluating us. Um, and send us a form and then we do a form for you and then hopefully we can start not this year but next year am i muted yes i'm unmuted so your your question is they have extra money to invest correct we have enough you tell us how much you raise, raise it so we, we we don't know how to run the business but Raising money is we can do it because we now we have a record. We have a successful record of returning money, of big money to investors. Yeah. So, that that I mean that's wonderful. The ACO as the entity can invest and the individuals can invest. Um, um, we 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 could talk uh, about the actual model that we have here. It's very uh, very fair and very equitable for our physicians, um, and um, it it's all going to depend, though, on in my opinion the the level of commitment and engagement that your physicians are willing to commit to. This is not going to be a product that you are going to get or something that you're going to get returns in one year. We're predicting to lose money for three years and then we're predicting to have healthy returns uh, because as you, you guys will know this, but it takes like a, could take sometimes a year and a half for MRA to get adjusted. Um, so the carry the carry expenses are a little bit high in the very beginning, but once it starts going, it should provide very very healthy returns. Uh, we're pre we're predicting here, um, you know, if you take the non risk track, 100% returns annually beginning year four and five. If you take the risk track, potentially 250% returns annually, um, and that would be just for Palm Beach County. That's awesome. So we we now let's move and then send us a form and then they give us the time and see we 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 show you how enthusiastic our physicians are to invest in you. Um, okay. So if if you want, we can go ahead and 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 put something together and get you guys to survey it out um, and see at what level of commitment. It is. I hate to say the, you know, money speaks, uh, put your money where your mouth is, but the reality is for something like this, we need the doctors all in, all in. 
um, and it, because the rewards are going to be really, really good. Um, we have to also take a look at some of the these doctors who are part of an MSO now may have already signed restrictions that they can't join other uh, MA plans. Uh, they, they, they provide a lot of different things in there that makes it difficult, like first right of refusal, this, this, this. Uh, but one of the things that we're finding is some of our doctors cannot take our plan because they're penalized. They can, they can lose their actual other plan um, if they do, so they're trying to work around it. So people sign things, um, and doctors are very innocent at times. They sign things without understanding what they're signing, uh, and then it comes back to bite them. Well, you warn us, so we're going to warn all our physicians, you know, check their, <laughs> check their MA plan, what they have signed. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Hanson, and we will stay in touch. And, you know, David, please pass the knowledge to David, and David can connect with us. Absolutely. Looking forward to making it happen. Okay, thank you. So thank you. This, this uh, Saturday, you know, we basically give money for people to attend. So uh, awarded all ACO uh, doctors, ACO physician, staff, their staff, the MA will be awarded to attend these meetings. We believe the message um, need to deliver very clear and this should be received. So one of the message we got during the meeting was that how I figured out whether I'm losing or gaining, saving money for my practice in ACO or I, how I'm gonna get big money uh, end of the year. So I and they will try to answer those questions to a lot of the people, but you know, but I found the physician don't put enough time to learn about this thing. So I asked David and Derek, listen, you can you can give us a short course on when we go to Blue Sky, where we need to go, and how we figure out we are making money or not making money or saving money. If not saving money, what we need to do to adjust. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, my name is Derek Pauley. I'm the Chief Information Officer for uh, Doctors ACO. Um, can someone make me presenter? I have some slides um, that I'd like to share. You go ahead. Do we have okay. the slide? Yeah. Yep, I do. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yes. Yes. All right, excellent. So congratulations, everybody, for a successful uh, 2019. Uh, 2020 looks great, and uh, today I want to show a few uh, a few slides about where you can find um, information about where you stand and what your PMPM is, and uh, the very important county benchmark uh, weights on your uh, your individual practice benchmark is located. So um, in these next few slides, I'm going to show you county expenditures uh, report, and then also uh, the ACO insights. And um, this couldn't have come better. These MRA courses couldn't come at a better time. Um, the the um, <clears throat> the ACO benchmark for this year for 2019 through uh, the end of the period in 2024 is going to be based upon 50% uh, county expenditures. That's going to be 50% weight on your benchmark. Is based upon um, the county expenditures for uh, the locations of your patient's primary residence. So whatever county they're in, Medicare takes the average of all of those counties for all of your patients and provides the ACO with a county, um, a county benchmark, a county weight, and that's 50% of the overall weight. Now the other 50% of the of the ACO benchmark and your practice benchmark is based upon the last three years of. Um, prior to the ACO contract start date. So Doctors ACO renewed as an enhanced track ACO in 2019. Doctors ACO benchmark for 2019, 2020, 21, 22, and 23 is based upon uh, 2016, 17, and 18 per capita expenditures. The Medicare averages them out. Um, and my next slide is gonna show you um, how the risk score, and I'm going to get into Blue Sky in a little bit, in a minute, but it shows how the risk score uh, will impact your county benchmark. So when you look at um, my slide here, um, 2016, so this is a scenario where we have a practice with a risk score lower than the county risk score. So you can see that the practice historical patient expense on average, the per capita expense is 10,016 
11,017 and 18, uh, 12,000 in 2018. What that means is that um, the benchmark for the average for those three years is $11,000. Now this practice also has a risk score of 1.05. Now the county expense, the county uh, benchmark is 11,000. And if you look at the county risk score of 1.10, it's a little higher than the practices. So when we do a risk ratio and we adjust this county risk score um, to the practice risk score level, that actually drops the benchmark from 11,000 to 10,500. So simply put, if your risk score is lower than the county, your county benchmark is going to drop and it's going to say your patients are healthier, therefore you're going to have less expense. And you know, Carrie did a great job of explaining this and it's been a, um, um, in terms of how risk scores affect expense. And so the risk adjusted county expense is 10,500. If we take the average of the two, 11,000 and 10,500, because 50% weight for each, that's a practice benchmark now of 10,750. Okay, so it's actually lower than where you started. And it's simply because the risk score is lower uh, than the county, the average of the counties where your patients live. Now, if we look at this scenario two, where the practice risk score is higher than the county, so we see the same 10, 11, and 12,000 during the benchmark years, the average of those three years is $11,000. The practice risk score now is, um, 10, uh, is uh, 1.25, and the county expense is the same as the prior example, 11,000, and then the county risk scores of 1.10, you can see that that risk-adjusted county benchmark jumps up to 12,500. So it goes from 10,500 to 12,500 simply by raising your risk score from a 1.05 to a 1.25. And, and a lot of times doctors, um, and you know, to Dr. Hansen's point and Carrie, they get, and Dr. Agarwal, they get paid for um, submitting a diagnosis, you know, so they submit any diagnosis to get paid and that's it. But that's, that, those, that's changing. So Medicare wants you to be very precise with your diagnoses and accurately uh, portray the, the risk of your, your population. So you can see now that if we take the average of 11,000 historical expense and 12,500 with a county expense, now you have 11,750 benchmark. So that's $1,000 higher uh, per patient um, than the lower risk score. And just to extrapolate this, if we take a, a 1,000 patients and 11,750 benchmark, that's scenario two, the higher risk score, and we, and we multiply that times 1,000 patients times the benchmark, we have $11 million, 11,750. And if we take the 1,000 patients multiplied by the 10,750 benchmark, that's the lower risk score, scenario one, that's a million dollar increase in benchmark times a 75% sharing rate. That's $750,000 to ACO, to the ACO revenue. Um, there will be a little bit of a quality haircut, but it shouldn't be much. Doctors ACO got a 97% score last year. So right there, just by paying attention to the coding, you created a million dollars in, um, in ACO savings, and that's $750,000 in ACO revenue. And that comes back to you. Um, not every dollar, there's a formula, but uh, it's a great way to increase revenue simply by paying attention to coding the things that are supposed to um, be happening during this value transition. And it goes right in line with Dr. Hansen and the Medicare Advantage plans. This is what they do. This is, it's a more direct relationship to risk score in Medicare Advantage. And so right inside Blue Sky, we thought, well, how can we make this easy for the physicians to, um, to look at their, their risk-adjusted county expense? And so in Blue Sky, you'll see a county expenditures uh, report, and if you look at it at the practice view, you can see your risk adjusted. I chose benchmark year 2018, and your risk adjusted county expenditures that would be the 10,750 or 11,750 from my prior slide. You can see right here what is my risk adjusted county expenditures. You can see. I chose Dr. Agarwal's uh, practice Athens Heart Center. Dr. Agarwal's um, county benchmark is 10,660 contribution. And you can see that it started off as 10,343. So Dr. Agarwal added $300 to his ACO benchmark uh, because he's, uh, his patients are uh, coded accurately um, at a higher level. So he's got a sicker population. And you really want your population to be accurately represented um, in your county benchmark. And now there's a and and soon what we're going to do what I'm what we're releasing in Blue Sky 
is uh, a way to project next year's county benchmark because you know that coding is based upon the prior year's diagnoses. So all the diagnoses and HCCs captured in 2019 now make up 2020's risk score for your population. All the diagnoses captured this year in 2020 will now become 2021's risk, um, uh, risk score. So we're going to take that 2021 risk score and apply it to your county benchmark, and we're going to be able to project so you can see your progress. You can see the benchmark that you're creating as you accurately code your patients and pay attention to it. And not everybody in the counties are doing that, so that's your opportunity now as an ACO. Uh, physicians that are not part of an ACO, other physicians are not paying attention to the coding like we are in doctor's ACO. So right there is the arbitrage. That's the advantage that we're going to get uh, because we're paying attention. It's relative. So the county benchmark is going to remain low, but we're going to pay attention to our county, uh, to our risk score. That's going to make our individual county benchmarks high. And so that's that's the plan. So that's why coding is so very important um, in, um, in uh, ACOs and Medicare Advantage. So if there's some county expenditure takeaways, if your PMPM -PM is higher, your per member per month expense, that's PMPM, -PM, per member per month, is higher than risk-adjusted county expenditure, then you are probably higher than your benchmark and you're losing money for the ACO. If your county benchmarks are just, um, and your county benchmarks are adjusted by your practice's risk score. And that's to say on the opposite, if your PMPM -PM is lower in your risk-adjusted county expenditures, then you're actually going to be uh, in a good position to save in the ACO. And so that's that's one area we want you to look at is a county expenditure report inside Blue Sky. And so now I'm going to shift gears to another report. We have a there's a lot of reports in Blue Sky, and they have a very valuable uh, contribution to the ACO. But the medical loss ratio and your PMPM, your per member per month expense. The medical loss ratio compares your current quarter PMPM to the average of last year. So it's a ratio. If you have a ratio, uh, MLR of greater than one, you are more expensive than last year, and that's bad. If your MLR is less than one, you are less expensive than last year, and that's good. The PMPM calculations are located at the bottom of the ACO Insights reports. So if you go into Blue Sky and you have your ACO Insights report up, as you scroll down, you'll see your medical loss ratios. You'll see 1.04. That means you can think of it as we're 4% more expensive than we were last year um, in the first quarter. Now in the second quarter, it's a 0.95. So that's good. We're 5% less expensive than last year. And then in the third quarter, we're about a 0.98 right now. Um, and so we want to be below that one. So if you go to your medical loss ratio, that's where you want to look. If you want to see how am I doing compared to myself last year. And if you had a good year last year and your MLR is below one, you're going to have a better, you're most likely going to have a better year this year. And same with um, if you're above it. If you're above, uh, your, if your MLR is above one, you might have a tougher year. So it's, it's something you want to talk to your ACO representatives. You know, I'm here to help as well identify areas, uh, uh, opportunities for improvement. And then way out the, at the bottom of the um, ACO Insights report, you have your total expense PMPM, and that's going to be uh, for quarter one, quarter two, quarter three. We also have average, weighted average, and year-to-date. So you can kind of see how am I doing year-to-date, how is, you know, what's my average. We weight it. Um, the weighted average just weights the number of beneficiaries you have assigned to that quarter. So if you have a lot more beneficiaries one quarter, it's going to have a higher weight on your weighted average. You know, it's just um, a typical weighted average report. So right here you can see the MLR, and then you can also have your PMPMs. And that's, that's going to tell you exactly where you are in the ACO. And if you want to take it a step further, we actually break it down. Blue Sky breaks it down by hospital, nursing home, home health. So you can see where your expense changes on a PMPM level based upon where is the spending for my patients? Where are they incurring these expenses? And so here's to a successful 2020. Finish strong. And uh, I'd like to open it up for any questions um, that anybody may have. So let me ask you, uh, the question was, my PMPM, you told me, and you told me the county PMPM. The county PMPM is fixed throughout the first, second, and third quarter, is that right? But my PMPM right. keeps going up and down. So one quarter I'm better, other quarter I'm worse. So how, what I need to do to get my PMPM better than the county? What are the well, three things I need to do to, to fix it? Sure, sure. Um, 
Well, with your PMPM, you want to work with the physician outreach program, the focus program. That's huge. That will be a big win for the ACO, um, and that gets patients better care in the, in the comfort of their homes um, from specialists. And then um, for every individual person, it may vary, every individual doctor. Uh, you definitely want to work on your risk score. You know, that's not going to impact your PMPM, but that's going to impact your county expenditure weight, and that's going to accurately uh, portray your patient population, the morbidity of your population. Sicker patients cost more. Um, and then we can look at various metrics. You can look at your emergency department visits per thousand. We have an ED frequent flyers report. Um, you want to look at your readmission rates. Um, there's different um, different practices of different problems. Maybe it's home health. Maybe the home health companies are, are doing a lot of recertifications on your patients and continuing to see them. Maybe your nursing home length of stay is longer um, than ideal. And uh, it's something we can look at. So it, it varies individually, um, but really it's keeping your arms around your flock. Um, and, and I would say that the big win for the rest of this year would be the physician outreach program. If, if you have patients um, that are pre-palliative, that need extra care through the holidays, um, talk to Brian and Rochelle um, and, and uh, utilize the outreach program, the focus so program. Please, please either text me on the chat or please come on, unmute yourself and ask questions. We have smart people who can answer the questions. You know, David uh, can explain, uh, Lou is there, can explain, and Dr. Arthur is there. And uh, so please open up and um, freely ask questions and then let's clear the air. If you can, again, if you don't want to talk, just send me the chat and I'll raise that question to them. The, while you're not talking, so I'm going to talk again. And I'll tell you the other thing we want to talk about is the uh, how we can do it. What can we do in next 80 days? That we talk about in all in 80 days if we start following the care tracker, which uh, I think we talk about during our celebration time. All that tape is available on YouTube as well as on the Doctors SEO website. And uh, if you sign up today. Uh, please, if you doctors at CEO practice, please make sure that your consultant know that you attended this meeting and the award will be coming to you. So again, any other question? Okay, the question is private. Can we, he summarize that BSA report, we want the practice PM, PM or expenditure to be higher or lower than county figure. That's it, you want to go ahead. Um, David or, or, or Derek, you want to answer sure, good question. question? When you look at the ACO Insights PMPM, you would like to be lower than the county expenditures. And that means that you're lower than half your benchmark weight. Very good. Good um, question. Thank you. So, David, I was really impressed with the explanation you gave to one of our ACO members, and you did a beautiful job explaining in the, you know, PMPM, county PMPM. Is that report available to you? Can you explain that, how, what happened to the, in that report without mentioning the practice? Sure, Derek, can you go back to the county PMPM slide? Yes. Um... So Blue Sky has done a very good job taking Medicare's exact rules and the data that they provide and giving you your exact regional benchmark. And then if you look at this slide here, it says 2020. So you can look and see what your 2020 regional benchmark is. So, you know, definitely if you already have your Blue Sky login, uh, get on there now. You click on county expenditures and you can see exactly where you stand. Now, this number down here at the bottom, it says 10660. You just have to divide that by 12. And then that's the PMPM PM that you have to beat. And you know, considering that you know 50% of your benchmark is that number exactly, you'll really like your performance payment if you can be 50 or hundred dollars less than this 888 number. And then every practice is different. So some of these we see they have. 12, 13,000 a year. And then some practices, they have a relatively healthy population and it's um, only 7,000 per year. So it's really important that you look in here and see your own customized benchmark. 
So Dr. Hanson, we had really major problem of people who had big money on our first successful operation in 2008. And then they were expecting that kind of check. And they didn't get that kind of check. Not hitting. You know what happened to me. So how do you handle that? Try, try again. So, so it's, it's, it's a learning curve. I think this is our fifth year in ACO and we have learned a lot. I think we have proven ourselves again and again that we are high quality and low cost physician group. I think we are basically looking forward to Dr. Hansen to see whether he can look towards us and, and convince him that at the county, the next so this is all. One time is up. If anybody has any question, please raise your hand or chat or come on, unmute yourself. Okay, so we have three minutes. Uh, David, can you talk very quickly? Tell us about what it can do to your practice through your chat in 2021. Um. We don't have enough time for care track. I wanted to talk about the physician payment. So we've been doing this for eight years now. And unfortunately, it feels like if a doctor has a great payment, it almost certainly ruins their following year. So we see often a great payment and a very low payment because the doctor feels like potentially that, you know, they got lucky or they don't have to work as hard because they're going to get these payments. And the reality is, is that you need to get that money and you need to invest in your practice. You need to hire staff. Maybe you hire a provider and you need to watch these numbers and you have to make sure the numbers and your MLR are improving. And that's the only way that you can guarantee that these payments continue to flow. And I hate to say it, but you know, I'm looking through the payments over eight years times a hundred practices and you see the doctors that learned the lesson. They have one year and it was a terrible disappointment. And then they realized that these numbers were available to them all along. And then from that point on, they fix it. And it's really great to message these doctors with three and four and five years in a row of perfect shared savings. But I, I always think back to that moment where they said, oh man, what a terrible year. I, I don't understand. I, I hate the ACO, but you kind of have to learn that lesson is that it's your performance doctor that influences the payment and it's always right here in blue sky thank you david i would like to introduce uh Brittany wood Brittany wood is our aco um, monitor she does the thing and and basically we have decided to invest in our practice so Brittany, tell us what you've done since uh, you started learning about the money um, so I had the opportunity to go down to Palm Beach to meet with Terry and learn about HCC coding, um, which was a great experience for me. So coming back, um, what we've done is we're focusing on our patients that are diabetic. We've created a quality core HIDA sheet that we go by and we are coding our diabetic patients correctly. Um, eventually we'll move into a congestive heart failure and then um, so on and so forth with our patients. So, so Brittany is not a certified coder, so we couldn't afford a certified coder until we have, have start talking to Dr. Hansen. So she is um, she's very, very smart. She learned very fast and then she start training other MA and we plan to you know keep doing this, learn learn more from Terry Terry and we, we will hopefully can increase our MRA and PMPM for the next year. So this Brittany's is awesome. She's number one questions? care tracker performer. You're lucky to have her, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So let me tell you one more time. So anybody who is belong to Dr. Tessie Hall, please let your consultant know that you attended this meeting and then you will see something magic. So until next week, next two weeks, we come back again with this team. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Okay. Thank bye -bye. you. Good night. Bye-bye.